welcome everyone to our Wednesday, April 24th school committee. If you would all join me for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you very much. And let me do just a quick introduction of our school committee. To my right, we have Mr. Tony Gelfi, Mrs. Rachel King, Mrs. Lillian Holbrook, Mr. Mike Dolan, Vice Chair, and our superintendent, Mr. Swenson. Uh, my name is Susan Prewandowski, and to my left is Mrs. Julie Skilparis and Rachel, who is from our Student Advisory Board. We expect Mr. Hammond to arrive shortly, and Mr. Marrera uh, will not be able to make it tonight due to a work commitment. And first on the agenda is the approval of the minutes for March 27th. Motion by Mrs. Holbrook, second by Mrs. King. Any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? So voted. And moving on to our correspondence recognition, Mr. Swenson. Thank you, Madam Chair. I am very proud this evening to recognize one of our wonderful Bridgewater Arena Regional High School uh, students, Mr. James McKnight. You can stand up, James. I received correspondence from our school nurse, Mrs. Brzezanski, on March 20, uh, I'm, not, I'm sorry, April 4th, which stated on March 25th, we had a medical emergency in a classroom. A student had a seizure. James jumped into action, assisted to the floor, took his jacket off and placed it under her head. He remained calm and appeared in control. He later came down with her things and explained what he had saw, which is very important in this type of emergency. I have called his mom to praise him for his actions. He is a Boy Scout and very proud of this. He explained that is what he learned and how to react as a Scout. Eagle Scout, thank you. <laughs> James, would you mind coming to the podium? <laughs> so thank you, James, for thank you, James, for your actions, your swift actions in helping that student. We're very proud of you. Is there anything that you would like to say? Um, I mean, just start that over. <laughs> it, thank you. It's really like things like this happen, and we all know that. But it's not. It's yes, scouting, but it's also because. Of it, it's who I am, right? It's primarily scouting because that's, I, again, I've learned everything, like with first aid and whatnot from an extremely young age. It felt like scouts was a secondary school for life lessons. And that's something that I feel it should be implemented into school itself. Now, I understand that, you know, things are what they are, and I get that. <laughs> but, you know, it's not everyone's readily, you know, readily available or prepared as I was. So, it, Literally, it feels like, it's almost like, it's not just teaching, it's life lessons that you should learn for the rest of your life and teach it to other people, friends, kids, if you have any, um, cousins, brothers, family members, etc. Well, we thank you for your swift action. Thank you very much. James, could you come and shake the hands of the And 
thank you, Mom and Dad, for raising such a wonderful uh, son. And James, if you could have a life lesson on civics right now and stay for the rest of this meeting, or you can go home and do your homework. Which one would you like to do? Homework. All right. <laughs> Spoken like a true Eagle Scout. Thank you so much. And then we just, if we can take the person. Madam Chair, I'd like to take item G out of order. Personnel report by Ms. Gorman. Motion by Mr. Dolan, second by Mrs. Holbrook. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Very good. Thank you. Good evening, Ms. Madam Chair, members of the school committee, Superintendent Swenson. I have the following personnel report. The following uh, people have been appointed by the superintendent. Lauren Weber, a long-term substitute, adjustment counselor at the Mitchell Elementary School through the end of the year. Alana McDermott, education support professional at Williams. The superintendent has also accepted the following resignations for the purpose of retirement. Louise Bramlett, education support professional at the Williams after 24 years of service, effective June 18, 2019. Teresa Lean, special education teacher at the Williams after 24 years of service, effective June 30, 2019. Cindy Dempsey, adjustment counselor at the high school after eight years of service, and that will be effective October 4th. Mary Bogle attendance supervisor for the district after 11 years of service, effective June 30th. We also have the first hire for the 2019-20 school year. Holly Hargreaves will be the new principal at the Law Liberty Elementary School. She holds a bachelor's degree in elementary education from Westfield State College and a master's of education in reading from American International College. Holly's experience includes District Director of Elementary Education, pre-K through grade five, Title I and Title IIA Director, Principal of an Early Childhood Education Center, Assistant Principal for ATECA, a Massachusetts public online school, and she was a classroom teacher for 16 years and a reading specialist for four. Holly's application packet included a story about her early days of teaching. I plan to read this as part of her introduction tonight, but I don't think I could have gotten through it without shedding a few tears of my own. That being said, I thought it was an important piece of Holly's background to share with the school committee, and I hope you all had a chance to read it. So without further ado, that ends my uh, personnel report, but I'd like to have Holly come up and meet with the school committee. Good evening. Thank you for that introduction. That was really nice. I just wanted to say um, I was excited and thrilled when Mr. Swenson called me and let me know that he was interested in hiring me for the position. But after spending a day at the Liberty today, I am even more so. I was welcomed by the staff, by the students who all appeared to be very excited to be meeting the next principal. Um, and keeping up with Mrs. Rodriguez was certainly a challenge. <laughs> but I enjoyed my day and look forward to spending a few more before the start of next school year. Thank you. Thank you. to recognize um, Julie Skilparis. This is her last meeting for school committee. So if you would join me and Mr. Swenson up at the podium. You. Yes. This certificate of appreciation is presented to Julie Skilparis as a token of esteem and recognition of the six years of dedicated service to the students of Bridgewater and Rainham. 
And then it just says Bridgewater Rainham Regional School District School Committee member 2013 to 2019. And we did list the subcommittees you were on, so I'm going to read them for you because there's quite a few. <laughs> uh, the signer of Warren's Budget Subcommittee, Budget Subcommittee Chair 2018-2019, Building Subcommittee, Policy Subcommittee, Negotiation Subcommittee, Site Dedication, Sick Leave Bank Subcommittee, Public Employee Subcommittee, and you were also the liaison to the Bridgewater Finance Committee, the Friends of Bridgewater Rainham Athletics, the Special Education Parent Advisory Council, and also to the Bridgewater Rainham Regional High School Advisory Council. And this is awarded by the Bridgewater Rainham Regional School District School Committee. And we are gonna miss you, and you've worked very hard these past six years. I don't think anyone's been on as many committees <laughs> as six you. years. <laughs> so congratulations. Thank you very much. Thank you. with you closely for two out of the six years. I have grown to admire your creative thinking. You always bring a different perspective to our conversations and your viewpoint has really made me stop and think. For that, I will be forever grateful. The students of the Bridgewater Rainham Regional School District have been lucky to have such a passionate and dedicated advocate in their corner. You have always listened to your heart especially when making difficult decisions, and have kept all the students at the forefront. I am sure our paths will cross again, 
After all, our town isn't really that big. Um, you will be missed on this team, and I would like to offer you nothing but best wishes as you move on. Thank you. And Mr. Scoperis, thank you for sharing Julie's six years. She's all yours now. <laughs> Whoops. All right, very good. So moving on in the agenda, uh, next up we'll have our educational report and we'll start with our Student Advisory Council report. Thank you, Madam Chair. The Student Advisory Council report is always a highlight of this meeting for me as it showcases some of the most wonderful and worthwhile events taking place at our high school each month. It's a nice reminder of why I serve on the school committee. Our first report tonight will be presented by the chairwoman of the board, Rachel. Good evening, school committee. Um, my name is Rachel Bistos. I don't know how many more times I'm going to have to say that. <laughs> <laughs> but tonight I'll be talking to you about AP exams, the AP Arts Center, and the Teacher Appreciation Project. So it's hard to believe, but AP exams at the high school are less than two weeks away. The R offers 11 different AP courses to juniors and seniors in the subjects of literature and composition, chemistry, psychology, U.S. history, studio art, biology, physics, <coughs> calculus, language and composition, statistics, and music theory. We want to wish all the AP students and teachers good luck in the upcoming weeks. On May 10th, the Advanced Placement Studio Art class has to send in five out of our 24 pieces created all year to the AP board. It will be scored and it will be de de determined whether we pass or fail the AP Studio Art exam based on these pieces sent in and digital submissions of the 19 remaining pieces as well. Before the mailing date, Mrs. Wood has a send-off party where our pieces are laid out in the art room and the teachers of the R are encouraged to take a trip with their classes to come see the work. Me and my seven other AP Art Studio classmates will all stand by our tables explaining any pieces and answering questions about their <coughs> ideas and creation. This school year, the School Committee Student Advisory Board once again conducted our Teacher Appreciation Project, where we asked each senior in class of 2019 to complete an appreciation form in their English classes for at least one teacher that truly impacted them during their time in high school. On the forum, students reflected on what they learned from that teacher and why that teacher meant so much to them. Overall, we received approximately 350 letters, which we will be sorting and distributing to the high school's teachers for a teacher appreciation day, which is on Tuesday, May 7th. This is a project we started three years ago because we wanted to give students an outlet to show their gratitude for at least one teacher they felt connected to. Over the past few years, the teachers at the high school who have received letters have responded very positively to this act of gratitude. We hope to continue this positive project at our school future graduating classes as well. Thank you. Thank you, Rachel. Thank you, Rachel. Emma. Good evening, school committee. My name is Emma Snodgrove, and today I'll be talking about the senior dates, the day of silence, and state government day. As we approach the end of the school year, there are many upcoming important events going on around the high school. On May 17th, the junior prom is being hosted at Ambrosia's in Foxborough. On May 21st, Academic Awards Night will be held. On this night, junior students are inducted into the National Honor Society and senior members of NHS are presented with their NHS awards for graduation. Additionally, different students are awarded with department awards, superintendents awards, and John Riley Achievement Awards. <coughs> On May 28th, the senior class will be participating in the senior stroll, where they dress in their caps and gowns and visit the district's elementary schools. Also on this day, the senior barbecue will be held on the turf field. On May 29th, Scholarship Night is being held in the auditorium for graduating seniors who are being awarded a scholarship towards college. On May 30th, the senior sale will take place on the Spirit of Boston, followed by the senior lock-in. Um, on May 31st, graduation will be held at 6 p.m. on the football field under the lights. And finally, on June 3rd, All Season Sports Awards is being held to honor the school's athletes for their performances on and off the field. Friday, April 12th, was the nationwide student-led day of silence with the Gay Straight Alliance at VR helped to raise awareness by encouraging students to participate in it, creating posters and selling buttons. On this day, staff and students who participate take a vow of silence to highlight the, the silencing of the LGBTQ people in schools. This day, those who participate in it are helping to raise awareness and take action for a positive change in the United States and the school system. On Friday, April 5th, two students from VR were elected to represent the high school at state government, at state student government day at the State House in Boston. 
Numerous students ran for the position, but only two students could win the election to represent the school. These two students were senior Andrew Barbetto and junior Colby Myers. On this day, Andrew and Colby debated two bills, one on banning tackle football for students under the seventh grade, and another on banning all flavored tobacco products. Both bills are currently going through the Massachusetts State Legislature. The students also recreated the legislative process on passing the bills. Thank you. Uh, 
which is Excellence Through Social Emotional Learning. Uh, we're actually part of a statewide network. The district applied to be part of this network two years ago. Um, we were not accepted, but we um, continued um, to seek the option of being part of that network, and we were fortunate enough to be accepted into this network this past year. Um, so the members of the XL team are here tonight to give you a quick overview of what we've uh, accomplished this past year in such a short amount of time, and really what our plan is going forward. Um, you can see the XL network is a network um, which is uh, really created, uh, the network itself is created by the Rennie Center in transforming education, uh, as well as partnering with the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education. Uh, and really the main mission of this particular network is the development of the social emotional skills. Um, and it's also an opportunity for districts to highlight and share best practices for districts such as uh, such as BR, or really in the infancy stages of this, um, to kind of come on board, learn from our current parts and other districts, but also learn from our partners at the state level and obviously at the Rennie Center. Um, so we've had a few different networking meetings this year. Uh, we meet at Weymouth High School. Uh, there's other districts there um, from across the state. You can see there's approximately 19 districts all together. Uh, we belong to the South Cohort, uh, but you can see the districts up there. So we, we belong to this network with Attleboro, um, Brockton, Brookline, Marshfield, Montmoy, which is down in the Cape, uh, North Public Schools, Weymouth, and Hanson. Hanson. Uh, so those are the schools in our cohort, you can certainly see the schools up there in the Northwest cohort as well. Um, we were actually coming together at a statewide network meeting uh, next Wednesday, May 1st. So all 19 school districts will meet together. Again, just allowing us to an opportunity to share best practices um, and report out on the progress and strategies that we've made as a district uh, this school year. Some of these districts were actually part of this network for two years now. Um, so again, they're a little bit further ahead than we are. Uh, but in many ways, we've actually uh, made tremendous progress. Um, and I think actually uh, catching up to some of our some of our colleagues uh, and, and maybe even surpassing others. Uh, so we're pretty excited about the work that's that's happened thus far. Uh, but we really, uh, as part of this network, we originally allowed to have 10 members on our on our district team. Um, and I can't say enough about the 10 members that we currently have and the amount of work and time that they've actually put in thus far. Our hope is that we will expand this. Uh, we've actually already started talking with the other schools that aren't represented right now um, uh, to come join our network and we've gotten a great response uh, thus far. Uh, but I do want to just highlight our other members of the XL team. Uh, Mr. Joe Blos from our Student Services uh, Department, uh, Ms. Fahey, our nurse leader, uh, Heather Smith, the school psychologist at Bridgewater Middle School, uh, Ms. Watson, the principal here at the high school, uh, Ms. O'Brien is a teacher here at the high school, uh, Mr. Matthew Clark is the assistant principal at the Williams, um, Tara Pappas is a special education teacher at the Williams, uh, Ms. Westell, Deb Westell is the principal at the Merrill, and Sue Gaffney is a teacher at the Merrill. The reason why you can see up there that uh, the Merrill, the Williams, and the high school have been selected, uh, they really kind of started to embrace some of this work early on and before we were part of this XL network. So we really wanted to kind of tap into some schools that had already really started this work across the district. Um, they've uh, you know attended professional development on their own. They've sought out ways to bring professional development into their school and to try different initiatives. <laughs> So as a you know collective unit, we really have to come together and share some of the best practices that are already going on in the district and put our collective heads together about what other options are there for us and what other you know, opportunities that we can seek. Um, but what we would like to share with you this evening, we have a short video uh, just to give you an overview of social emotional learning. We want to share with you the impact of social emotional learning. And then we also want to share with you um, some thoughts and ideas. The uh, Excel network team, the district team, uh, we've created our own mission statement, which obviously, as you know, ties right into one of our pillars on our student success plan, our safe and supportive schools plan. Uh, so this team will really kind of morph into uh, the action planning team uh, working on that particular pillar. Uh, but then each member of the Excel team is going to um, share a, a different uh, SEL um, component or competency with you, just to give you an overview of some of the work that we're working on. Um, that we've currently worked on and that we will be working on going forward. Um, so without further ado, I'm actually going to turn this over to Ms. Vicky. Uh, Thank you. So my first slide is easy. It's what is social emotional learning? And we're going to find out in this short clip, this short video. Social-emotional learning is essential 
It's the tools that kids need to be resilient, to be problem solvers, to be good people. SEO is really about the holistic development of, of young people. SEL is trying to bring balance to the individual and what are the personal competencies you need to develop to be successful. How do you pull them all together so that kids can relate and navigate the world more effectively? The myth was that knowledge was information that could be bolted onto a brain like any other kind of mechanical part. The truth is knowledge is constructive. The truth is all learning is relational. The truth is that emotion drives attention, and attention drives learning. Social and emotional learning is about how you do school. It's about what the student experiences, what the student learns, how teachers teach. You can think about schools and classrooms, uh, out of school time spaces, families, etc., as places where there's an exchange of knowledge, knowledge about the world, knowledge about yourself and knowledge about the other persons that you're interacting with. All of those kinds of experiences, I think, help to form and expose and shape the ways in which young people understand themselves and other people. And we start talking about the whole child, because your child understands self-awareness, really understands social awareness, make good decisions, are they responsible? And then we start talking about what that applies to academics and looking at all the essential skills we need them to be successful in life. Children learn when their heart is open, engaged, connected, and filled with purpose. Learning is magical, and through SEL, we can create conditions that allow all kids to access that magic. So the impact of social emotional learning um, is profound. 30%, uh, the Rennie Center determined that basically 30% of employers believe that college graduates lack the skills their businesses need, like goal setting, cooperation, and awareness. That is a sad um, statistic, I believe. So the impact of social emotional learning on student achievement, SEL leads to better academic performance, higher college retention rates, and increased employment. Health and well-being, which is close to my heart, um, it, this social emotional learning is linked to lower levels of aggression, depression, anxiety, substance abuse, obesity, and criminal activity. We've discussed at a lot of our recent meetings uh, the increases in mental health issues and the number of psychosocial visits that we're seeing in the health office and the fact that they are on the rise. Social emotional learning curriculums will help in all of these areas. Return on investment estimates, estimates suggest an average return of $11 for every $1 invested in effective school-based SEL programs. That's why we joined that cohort of districts to look at best practices so we can put the best possible program going forward for our students. Thank you, Ms. Faye. So, given this tremendous need for social emotional learning in our schools, uh, our first uh, priority as an Excel team was to really try to formalize and articulate this, this goal and what the vision for social emotional learning was in our, in our district, uh, we uh, first chose to uh, craft a mission statement. Um, and uh, the mission statement and the coming uh, you know, visual model for our instructional framework both came from the Collaborative for Academic, Social, and Emotional Learning, uh, which abbreviates to CASEL. Um, and uh, we chose that CASEL model after reviewing many social emotional frameworks and a lot of literature uh, and considering as a team what we felt was the best representation of the work that we wanted to do here at VR. Uh, and we crafted the mission statement from a similar mission statement that, that CASEL uh, had provided. Uh, and it states, the mission of the Excel team is to create a safe and supportive learning environment through social emotional learning where every student and staff member is seen, valued, and heard. Uh, an essential component to, you know, to this mission, mission statement is uh, remembering that while we, of course, think of our students first, we want our staff and every you know, person in our school buildings and who's affiliated with our, our school communities to be you know, um, seen, valued, and heard, and 
feeling uh, safe and secure day to day so that they can best do their jobs as teachers or as learners. The visual representation of the instructional framework, uh, which also was uh, adapted from the uh, CASEL framework, um, is uh, up on the screen here. You'll notice that the five spokes uh, on the interior of the, of the CASEL wheel are five core competencies that CASEL outlines for success in social emotional learning. And members of our Excel team here are going to highlight each of those five areas and give you both what the core skills are and how we're already seeing some of those core skills take shape in the form of instruction in some of our schools. I think one of the biggest strengths of our uh, Excel team is that you know, we represent a diverse span of grade levels across the district. So you're going to see how uh, each of our Excel members uh, personalizes and explains some of these core competencies through the lens of their particular building or grade level or area of, of expertise. Um, another um, piece to you know, notice um, as you look at the instructional framework uh, up on the um, screen here is that this filters through um, the work um, in the five spokes in, you know, in the middle of the five core competency areas, also filters through uh, classrooms or curriculum and instruction, schools or school-wide policies and practices, and also uh, family and community partnerships. So there's a lot of levels and a lot of lenses that social-emotional learning passes through, and that was very important to us in, in adopting this model, just like we have academic instructional frameworks and models as well. So next up, Ms. Westell is gonna talk about one of those uh, key competency areas and describe uh, self-awareness. Thank you and good evening. So self-awareness is the ability to accurately recognize one's own emotions, thoughts, and values, and how they influence behavior. The ability to accurately assess one's strengths and limitations with a well-rounded sense of confidence, optimism, and a growth mindset. So the core skills that you would find under this would be identifying emotions, which we know for as adults sometimes it's difficult for us to determine how do we feel, never mind a, a child or a young adult to say, all these feelings are going on inside of me, I don't know how to express them, and, and sometimes that results in behaviors or, or dysregulation or those types of things. Another thing would be accurate self-perception, recognizing strength, self-confidence, self-efficacy, agency and reflection. Some of the things that we're seeing now that's starting to happen throughout VR is zones of regulation. Zones of regulation is when, um, especially at our level at Merrill School K-1, we'll ask, we'll say, are you um, green today, you red? Something that's simple that, can, uh, that a child can relate to. Green, we know, yes, I'm, I'm great, I'm ready to go, I'm ready to learn. Red, no, I'm not ready to learn. What can we do to help you? A Zen Den, uh, we have spaces um, in schools, and I, and I can certainly speak to Merrill. Each classroom, each area in Merrill, whether it's the library, the cafeteria, the, uh, the gym, we, there's a, a common corner, some people call it a take five. Um, what we have there is a, it's like a cool down session, or it's a Zen Den, a place where a student can go and say, look, I just need five minutes. How many of us say that in the course of the day? I just need five minutes. Well, now students have that place to go to. And through the generosity of our ECPO, we've actually created sensory toolkits. And in these toolkits, we have things that students can use to calm down, whether it's um, articles that they, the squeezing balls, or we can have, uh, there's a lot of fun things in there, things you can twirl, you can see them going up and down, just something to calm you down. We also teach breathing strategies. We, we teach children how to breathe, five finger breathing, you know, smelling a flower, blowing out the candle, those types of things just to calm down your body. Uh, we also have reflection worksheets, personal <coughs> journals that reflect how students learn rather than what they have learned. And again, to personalize this from, from Merrill School, we have created a, a group of teachers between about eight of us, and we call ourselves the Safe and Supportive Team. And as a Safe and Supportive Team, we looked at, we took a survey of all the staff members, and we looked at what are our urgencies. From that, we looked at the things that we wanted to look to um, really hone in on as what our our goal is for Merrill School. So one of the things we started was morning meeting. This past September, every classroom at the same time, between 20 past nine and 10 of 10, morning meetings going on, the entire school. And I pop in, or the phys ed teacher can pop in, we can invite one of our um, K-1 
cafeteria workers or the custodian or the secretary, everyone's involved in morning meeting. And it's just that, you come in, you meet, you greet each other, you have uh, an activity to do, you share if you'd like to, but it's something that the whole school is doing at the same time. And as a team, a safe and support team, we thought it was important for us to do it school-wide. And we're able to readjust our schedule, and it's something that, that's really sacred in our school every single morning. Again, I talk about sensory toolkits. We have morning check-ins. There are some kids that really just need to pop in in the morning at the, in the office and we sit and have breakfast or we sit and have a chat before they go in. We also have a kitchen table. We literally have a kitchen table in Mr. Poulos' office. And what we do with this kitchen table is we have breakfast. Sometimes I have lunch with students. Sometimes students have projects to do and maybe they don't have anybody at home to do them with. So they come down to the kitchen table at, in the office and we do it with them. That whole sense of family, that whole sense of you know doing your homework at the kitchen table is now done sometimes in the office. We have uh, we provide PD for our teachers. We also have our own school mascot now, which is a huge success with our students. Um, and we also have something that the, the uh, safe and supportive team is called Educated Wellbeing. One of our PDs, we had yoga for all of the teachers at one time. Uh, had someone come in and do yoga with, with all of us, some breathing exercises. We have uh, teachers know that if you need a break, they can go off into their classroom for five minutes, take a break. All these things that we're talking about to support each other so that we can support the kids. Thank you, Ms. Mustel. So the second segment of the five-part wheel is social awareness. Social awareness is the ability to take the perspective of and empathize with others, including those from diverse backgrounds and cultures. The ability to understand social and ethical norms for behavior and to recognize family, school, and community resources and supports. Some of the core skills that speak to this are perspective taking, and just like Ms. Westell said, this isn't just about the students. Often as adults, we struggle with some of these skills and concepts, so it's important for all of us, regardless of age, position, any of those things, that we're all working on these things. So perspective taking could be difficult for, for a lot of people. Um, empathy, appreciating diversity, respect for others, or agency in understanding. Those are the core skills. Some ways that these skills are already being applied and built upon it from the K-12 level. At the elementary school, they do word of the month discussions. So perhaps the word of the month, this month is respect. So throughout the day in all of the different classes, the teachers are talking about respect, the students are talking about respect, they're infusing it into the curriculum. Another um, application is taking the perspective of a character in a story students are reading, and that's something that can be done pre-K through 12. Um, I know I can only speak at the high school level, we do that often in all of our English classes as well as our history classes. Um, discussion of world events, watching or reading impactful news stories and then discussing them. And a great example of agency at the high school level is having our student council have a voice in district topics which is really important for students to, to have a voice and to be able to speak um, about different things at different levels to be involved. And now I'm going to turn it over to Mr. Clark. Good evening, uh, Matt Clark, the Assistant Principal at the Lave School, and I'm here to talk about responsible decision making. This is the ability to make constructive choices about personal behavior and social interactions based on ethical standards safety concerns and social norms, the realistic evaluation of consequences of various actions and a consideration of the well-being of oneself and of others. The core skills here um, are identifying problems, analyzing situations, solving problems, evaluating, reflecting, ethical responsibility, and agency and choices. Now some of the applications of responsible decision making may be uh, setting up key stations in classrooms where students can go and resolve conflicts with one another, as an assistant principal, this would be fantastic for me. <laughs> um, as far as um, you know, um, teachers, they could uh, perhaps give uh, students a range of options for completing assignments. Um, they could uh, give students some, some voice by allowing students to evaluate uh, their lessons. Um, this would create a student-centered atmosphere where uh, students feel like they have some input. Uh, and finally, encouraging students to set achievable goals. 
These are not only uh, great things for, for students, but for faculty, for adults, for parents. Um, so, thank you. Hi everyone, I'm Heather Smith. As a school psychologist, I can talk about social emotional learning forever. I want to go home tonight, so I'll stick to self-management, um, which refers to taking responsibility of one's own well-being and behavior by successfully regulating emotions, thoughts, and behaviors in different situations. This includes effectively managing stress, controlling impulses, and motivating oneself. Um, it's the ability to set and work towards personal and academic goals. So, core skills. Um, we're teaching both explicitly and through modeling um, impulse control strategies, stress management, self-discipline, self-motivation, goal setting, organizational skills, and promoting agency in creating vision. Um, application includes strategies pertaining to impulse control. Um, we mentioned various regulation strategies and grounding techniques. Um, there's five finger breathing, which pre-K through middle high school, really we can use. Lots of different types of deep breathing, um, grounding techniques, 7-Eleven breathing, belly breathing, hot chocolate breathing. Um, we are teaching mindfulness, um, beginning to really introduce the concept of mindfulness to our students, which also helps with stress management. Um, this involves being present in the moment without judgment. Um, mindfulness offers ways to practice single tracking your mind. Um, and it helps us consciously choose our next action um, and have control over that. Uh, we also mentioned um, Zen dens and um, places to kind of cool down, remind you of you know zones of regulation and regulation strategies. Um, we have sensory toolkits in various um, parts of classrooms, um, which offer, like Deb was saying, some you know fidgets and um, honey, things like that. Uh, we also utilize behavior charts or um, behavior contracts or um, certain agreements that we draft up, um, which often involves, at least initially, students working towards sometimes a more tangible reward, um, but the goal is to progress to um, those students developing their own goals and buying in um, to work towards those goals and developing that intrinsic motivation. Um, and then finally, uh, we utilize checklists and rubrics, um, both you know pertaining to academic assignments um, to foster time management, um, breaking down long projects or assignments, um, as well as personal kind of timelines and uh, management of long and short term goals for students. So. Sorry. 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 <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Uh, my name is Laura O'Brien and I am a teacher at the high school. And I was super excited when Ryan and Angela asked me to be part of this initiative. Um, the relationship skills part of the wheel is one that we really at the high school have kind of picked apart and started some really fun initiatives and things that we are already doing. Relationship skills is defined as the ability to establish and maintain healthy and rewarding relationships with diverse individuals and groups. The ability to communicate clearly, listen well, cooperate with others, resist inappropriate social pressure, negotiate conflict constructively, and seek and offer help when needed. Uh, it really boils down to just being able to have successful communication with all kinds of people in all kinds of situations, and to be able to express empathy. Um, the core skills included in relationship, in the spoke of the wheel, include communication, social engagement, relationship building, teamwork, and agency and positive interactions. There's a lot of crossover between the different competencies in the wheel, um, and I'm gonna go out of order on the application side and just start at the bottom with the morning meeting, evening meeting, or advisory box, because that's the part of the relationship skills initiative that we really have taken off with. And really have to give props to Deb Mostel and Sue Gaffney and the team, because in speaking about our initiative and our, and our team, they, it was their idea to invite Dean Gastoni, who's here tonight, he's the Excel director, to invite Dean and I to come and, and see a morning meeting in a first grade classroom. 
So um, we went and we saw all of the things that Deb described in Sugiyaki's classroom, and it was it was truly amazing. And we watched a morning meeting, and then from there we just took that and we adapted it first and rolled it out with our night school students. In you know with, with the understanding that the, the population can be challenging and they come to us with baggage and trauma and all kinds of things that are the reason why they don't succeed often in a traditional daytime setting. And we decided that we would start right from day one this semester and we would build relationships with these, with these students. So we took the model that at the elementary level and we just turned it into an evening meeting and we start every Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday with the chairs in a circle and we have a topic. And the difference between how the relationships that we have with these kids this semester compared to last semester is just, I, mean, I could go on and on about how amazing an experience it's been and how the attendance of the kids, um, the, the tardiness to night school has gone way down because they don't want to miss that part of the evening. And even if we don't have them in a particular class that evening, all of the staff that works in the XL knows not only the names of all of the students, but a great deal about them. Um, and it's just been an amazing experience. So from there, after we had such great success with the, the evening meeting at the night school, for fourth term as a result of this committee, Angela and I rolled out a pilot in which we started a Monday morning meeting just for fourth term with just a volunteer group of teachers. We just put it out there and said, who wants to do this? And I just created sort of a, a, a document with different topics and just asked for their feedback. And the feedback that we got from these awesome folks that just put themselves out there and said, yeah, we'll try it, has been incredible. Um, so you, the hope is that eventually a Monday morning meeting would become the way that Deb runs it at her school. It, it would kind of evolve and be something that would, would be happening school-wide at the high school, if not next year, hopefully the following year. And we have our long block every day of the week, and we have a rotating schedule. So the, the Monday morning meeting would only impact one academic class once every seven weeks which would eliminate any concerns that people may have about instructional time. Um, and over the course of the year, you would have that 15 to 20 minute non-academic social interaction with your class one to two times per term. So um, we're excited to hopefully roll that out. And we're also, you know, we're expanding, as Ryan said earlier, our team to include people from all buildings and hope that that would become a district-wide initiative. Um, so those are the things that we're really excited about at the high school. We've done some other activities that Angela has read in order to identify kids that may not have relationships with individual teachers. We've done uh, an activity at faculty meetings and ongoing, and then Angela's collecting data, and we're hopefully going to identify kids that, when given a list of names, no particular teacher could say that they really knew very much about that child. And we'll be able to then use that data to um, identify those kids. And once people know that these are kids that feel they don't have a strong connection or a strong relationship with any one adult in this building, we know that our teachers will go out of their way to strike up a conversation about a baseball game or a movie or anything at all to um, make sure that every single child in our building feels like they have some human connection to some adult in our building. So that's a huge, um, a huge goal for us and one of, about which I am so excited. At the elementary level, as I said, I think these applications are very similar. I think you change the vocabulary um, and maybe change the schedule, but obviously we don't have recess. They're doing things like a buddy bench at recess, which in, in sort of the way I think about that is an elementary adaptation of us as adults figuring out how at the high school we're going to identify kids that don't have any connections with adults. Um, and providing opportunities to work in groups or with a partner working as a mediator when two students are in an argument, and establishing math and reading partners, which would be academic at the core, but you hope that the side effect is that when you put kids together, they might become friends. Um, so I will turn it back over to Ryan, and thank you very much. Thank you. So again, I can't thank enough the members of the team and uh, for you know for being here tonight and sharing their information with you, but also their commitment uh, throughout the school year. And, and obviously, you can see uh, the application already going on back in their buildings. Um, I, I think one thing to you know to highlight: we've obviously had a lot of teachers come forward to say, "I want to be part of this." Uh, but one of the great pieces of feedback that we're getting actually from the students. I know Ms. Watson and Ms. O'Brien could, could probably share more, um, but but they're they're getting feedback from the kids saying something's going on 
we're, we're doing these activities in some of our classes, and it's not just one class, it's happening in several classes, and we love it. Uh, we're actually getting to talk to our teachers, we're getting to talk to our, our you know, uh, colleagues, our other students in our class. Things that maybe you know weren't happening in the past. So it's you know the benefits going to be there. You can see from those early slides. I mean, ultimately, what are we all here for, right? The academic success of our students. Um, and I can tell you firsthand, uh, doing this work as a building principal, uh, you know, scores in, in which unfortunately we're not all about, but you know, we're sometimes measured by those. So scores are going to go up. Students are going to be ready and available to learn, and they're going to have great student success academically if we can focus on the social, emotional, um, and behavioral aspects of their life. Um, so going forward, you can see some of the things that you know we're obviously uh, having the works. Um, certainly, this uh, again all ties back into our student success plan. Safe and supportive schools is one of our main pillars, and we're obviously working on that. Um, you can see that we're going to uh, you know continue to expand our Excel team uh, to include representation from all schools. Um, we obviously will be working on uh, creating um, action plans uh, to accomplish uh, to really kind of highlight and, and identify what we really hope to accomplish the rest of this year and then going forward. And you know we're, we're trying to model uh, best practices starting at the administrative level. level. Our last two administrative councils, uh, we've opened uh, meetings with social emotional learning activities uh, because it's important for Derek and, and I to model what uh, we hope our principals uh, will in turn model for their staffs who will hopefully in turn model that for their students. Um, so we, we are committed to it. I can't thank Mr. Swenson enough. Um, it's something that I, I talked to him about when I first uh, came to Bridgewater Rainham, and it's something that you know we've continued to talk about. Mr. Swenson is 100% behind it, as is the school committee. Uh, so I can't thank you enough uh, for your support as well. Um, at the end of the day, I know we all want what's best for the students of Bridgewater Rainham, and this is certainly part of it. Um, and you've committed yourselves to that. Uh, our principals and other administrators and our teachers uh, are too. So. Uh, the, the future is very bright for Bridgewater Rainham in many different ways, um, certainly through the social emotional learning lens. Um, so I just wanted to thank you. Uh, we're happy to uh, you know, answer any questions. Um, I know we were maybe a little bit longer winded than we had uh, hoped, but you can see the passion of this group and what we uh, really you know uh, are invested in and want what's best for our students going forward. So uh, again, hats off to my team, uh, our team, and obviously thank you to Mr. Swenson and the school committee. said um, the work that Mr. Powers and uh, our Excel team um, is a very proactive approach to try to curb um, some of these issues. As you know from a budgetary standpoint we're advocating for more school psychologists and school adjustment counselors um, which are great those are needed absolutely um, but those folks are there um, it's almost a, a band-aid approach we really truly need to take a more proactive approach in incorporating this type of learning within our classrooms each and every day. I will say that, um, speaking with Mr. Powers since he's come uh, to our district, uh, this is really truly his wheelhouse. And I really trust him uh, when he tells me that these things, if implemented with fidelity, are gonna work and are gonna have those students that may become dysregulated be able to regulate themselves and, and identify, like we said in these course, and be able then to access the curriculum. That's what this is all about. Um, so kudos to all of you. I'm so proud tonight with all the work that you folks have done. I, I really truly am. And. Um, says um, you know at the beginning of our admin meetings you know Mr. Powers has begun to uh, incorporate um, some of these uh, strategies we did a mood meter at the last uh, two the last month's meeting and this morning we actually did 
a um, mock um, morning meeting, which was great, where we um, introduced one another and then we shared something about ourselves. And actually we did some type of activity that was actually linked to academics. So those types of things are going to get students uh, engaged, feeling connected, and actually then being able to access uh, an educational component too. So again, kudos to you folks. I, I'm so proud of the work. I'm so excited to see where this is going to go uh, in terms of incorporating it into all of our schools. And I really truly think over time, if, if, if implemented with fidelity, we're truly gonna see um, some of that uptick in those social emotional issues begin to uh, decline. And that's the ultimate goal, along with this becoming, um, allowing ch children to be ready to learn each and every day. So thank you once again. Did anyone have any questions, Mrs. King? Um, I've actually seen this in practice. My youngest daughter is at the Merrill. Um, the things that Mrs. Westell has incorporated there this year, are amazing. They're, the kids are so excited in the morning. They love that morning meeting. It kind of gives them that transition period into the day. And Mrs. Gaffney goes above and beyond. Her greeting with each child is personalized. Um, her classroom is having a crazy mood. <laughs> her classroom has alternative seating and wherever the kids are comfortable. So her classroom is amazing. If any of the, <laughs> if anyone has a chance to see her classroom, I really suggest it. Um, her kids are so excited and so involved. Um, it's, I'm, I'm really so happy with what they're doing there. The two things, I said this to Mr. Powers during the presentation, um, we need to make sure we incorporate some of what you talked about in the Mitchell building. Um, it, it, Ms. Holbrook, Mr. Swenson and I serve on that committee and we need to make sure that when, now that we're in design phase that we really look at a lot of these things and make sure that they're in the building. And, and believe it or not, just, you know, obviously yep. knowing the designs, but they are there. Um, they might not be necessarily being utilized in this way, uh, but there's spaces you look at something like the OT room, an occupational therapy room, or the AP room. There's equipment in there that all of our students can benefit from. Typically, you know, the students that benefit from those services are, are students that are on IEPs and require those type of therapies. But the equipment in there, the um, instruction that those students receive, are actually benefiting all of our students. And I know when we looked at uh, having APE space or OT space, we made sure it was large enough that we it wouldn't just be for one student uh, receiving, uh, you know, uh, OT services. It could be for a number of students going in there. That a room might be large enough for a swing or for a regulation ball pit or um, a, an area big enough to do some of these uh, self-regulation movements. Um, Again, because I think we can, the, the spaces are there, we just need to tap into utilizing them for all of our students. And, and then my second thing is, would there ever be a point where we would present this to parents? I, I think that not just the parent groups, but mm -hmm. parents in general would, this might be a value to share with our families. Absolutely, I think it's just, you know, I mean, our hope is that it becomes uh, woven into the fabric of our schools, so it's it's much like when the principals or the teachers get up at open house or other type of uh, events where they're talking about what we do in math and what we do in reading. This is also what we do in SEL. Um, this is how we're, you know, helping your students uh, to be successful, not just academically, but um, overall, uh, the whole child. So I, I don't disagree at all. I, I definitely think it's something that happy to continue to talk about with, with any group that will listen. Um, but certainly to your point, you know, letting the parents know that these are things we're working on. We can certainly have some type of uh, parental meeting or, or for that information. But, you know, I think the ultimate goal would be then to have it just be part of the fabric of the school. Thank you. Yeah. Mr. Gelfi. Yeah, just being a teacher in, teacher in Brompton, Mr. Powers, um, I, I've seen it in my, I've used it in my, my classroom and I've seen it work with, with kids using the skills that they were taught throughout the year. It's really, really impressive. And to your point, um, oh my God. God. Michael. Michael. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, I have, I've, 
gotten feedback from parents because yep. they see they see the difference at home too and the way they handle the situation. Right. Yeah, and I think that that I thought had that thought when I saw that circle and it said um, community. Mm -hmm. uh, I, that really resonated with me. Even even our sports teams, our town sports teams, our Girl Scouts, our Boy Scouts, all of that. I, th I think it's transferable across the board. Um, and if we can really incorporate it beyond our schools, I think we'd be serving our students even more. Anyone else? Well, thank you very much, everyone, for coming. Uh, for that report and thank you Mr. Powers every month you sure. give us a wonderful educational report and sure. we appreciate that very much um, and then now we're going to move on to our administrative and school committee reports and first we have our budget subcommittee update Mrs. Lopez. Okay. Uh, the budget subcommittee met on Wednesday April 10th um, here at the previous meetings in March it was pretty mild um, in attendance for myself and Dr. Pierandowski and Tony as part for members, and Mike was at a work commitment. Um, at the meeting, Mr. Conley uh, gave the Treasury report, which we will also present tonight. Ms. Macedo reported on the fiscal year 19 budget, which she will report on tonight. Uh, Mr. Fox gave a facilities report and shared the capital approval plan. We had a few adjustments for him, but and he will give us a more updated one before his departure. Um, he, but we did have one voting item, so I would, in a formal motion, I would like to move the surplus and Mr. Fox up on the agenda. Sure, motion by Mrs. Copera, second by Mrs. Holbrook. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Mr. Fox, you're up. Good evening, Madam Chair, Superintendent Spuds, and members of the school committee. This evening, I'm here to ask permission to there are two uh, Merco Fry Masters as surplus. They're original to this building and were designed with it. Uh, because the school district no longer fries food, they've since become obsolete materials. I'm asking permission to uh, uh, find the proper means to uh, uh, put better use to them, to clear them as surplus, and ultimately get them out of the district. So do I have a motion to declare the fry later surplus? So motion by Mr. Dolan, second, second by Mrs. Scoparis. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? So voted. And thank you as well, Mr. Fox, for all your hard work for the district. We wish you the best of luck in your new job. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yes. Okay. So that, that was the tip, that was the easy meeting. Um, there was an additional info session at, held at Bridgewater State College on Monday evening at 6 o'clock uh, with a delayed start at 6.30 with traffic for one of the uh, present presenters. The informational session was arranged by Senator Pacheco to help us understand the funding formula for schools and um, Senator Jason Lewis, the co-chair of the Joint uh, Committee of Education, was also there. Um, in attendance were school committee, local school committee, super, school committee members, superintendents, and Bridgewater was fortunate enough to have town councilor Sean George, assistant town manager Kim Williams, and teacher Ashley. Is it Slater? Oh, no. Ashley, formerly Ashley Slater, and I forget her married name. Now, <laughs> but. The presentation was the funding formula, how it works, and why it needs to be fixed, followed by questions and answers. Um, they explained the education reform efforts on Beacon Hill, the Governor Baker Bill, the Representative Tucker's Bill, the Promise Act. We talked about what makes up funding. Step one, calculating the foundation budget, which is done at the Senate House Ways and Means. Step two, calculate the local contribution. Step three, Chapter 78 is supposed to make up the difference between state and local aid and how local aid is calculated. Local property values plus local income equals the ability to pay. The combined effort yield divided by the foundation budget equals the total local share. We all know that the budget that we proposed is still a work in progress from the town side. So, you know, I am who I am and that's what they tell us it is. The problem is the foundation budget is significantly, significantly underestimated actual cost resulting in inequities across the districts. Um, the top three cost drivers were health insurance. There's a $1.4 billion gap between the foundation budget and actual costs. Uh, special ed costs, 
0.03 billion dollar um, variance in estimates versus actual cost, and then out of district, 159 million dollar gap. And then out of district isn't necessarily special ed; it was um, in reference to charter schools. Um, they said the next steps would be to implement the recommendations of the Foundation Budget Review Commission, um, engage and get feedback to the House, Senate, and Governor Baker to make education funding a priority. Myself and Mr. Uh, George were like, okay, those are problems for some districts, but for our district, transportation. The regionalized districts are, you know, we are encouraged to regionalize and we are to get 100% for transportation, and it's really around 70%. Um, you know, that 30% would go a long way in helping us achieve the budget that we, you know, we need and want for our students. Um, in the question and answer highlight section, they compare and contrast the legislative bills and the governor's bill. Um, a superintendent of another district, uh, Somerset Berkeley, mentioned the inequities in some regional -like districts to provide funding appropriately. You know, the Somerset and Berkeley aren't equal, which one are them aren't equal when it comes to residential versus commercial. Doesn't mean our students aren't entitled and deserve, you know, proper funding. Um, lack of promise funding for regional -like school transportation, any issues with that, uh, maybe address them to Senator Adam Hines. And then, um, this kind of hurt because there's been references to student enrollment going down here, and we talked about how it's not going down and why class sizes are going up in our district because of the funding and trying to save money. Uh, but they said that statewide student enrollment trending is going down, but there are no change in the formula, so districts with increasing enrollment may actually suffer. Bottom line is they know it's broken, the formula's broken, we don't get the money we need. Um, and they're working on it, but it's going to be phased in and possibly over seven years due to inflation. So fight the fight, and even though I'm stepping back, I'm going to continue to fight the fight, and I hope that, I know, I trust that this table will, and I hope that others will too. Well, so. Thank you very much for attending that meeting. I appreciate that. All right. And next up, we have our long-range planning subcommittee report, Mrs. Holbrook. Thank you, Madam Chair. The Long Range Planning Subcommittee met on Monday, April 22nd, and the following committee members were present, Mr. Dolan, Mrs. King, and myself. Mr. Shantz, Mr. Swenson, and Mrs. McDougall were also in attendance. We invited Mr. Shantz, the district's IT manager, to our meeting to outline for us the technology needs of the district as he saw them. They aligned very nicely with what the committee saw as a plan for the next five to ten years. We asked Mr. Shantz if he would please put together um, for us a five-year plan of his priorities of each of the five years. Also, um, as part of your packet this evening, you should have all received a copy of the timeline for the superintendent's evaluation cycle the superintendent's goals for 2018-19 school year, the end of the year cycle summative evaluation report for the superintendent, as well as the model rubrics for the superintendent's evaluation. While the superintendent's evaluation is not until July, we thought it would be best for the committee to familiarize themselves with these documents and ask any questions prior to evaluating the superintendent. As the evaluation deadline comes closer, Dr. Prewindowski will give us further information on when she would like the evaluations to be turned into her so that she can compile them and the results can be reported out to the committee in July. And that is the end of our report. Very good. Thank you very much. Uh, next up, we have the Mitchell School Building Project update. Mr. Swenson. Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. On Monday, April 1st, um, our OPM, Shane Nolan, and lead architect, Jean Raymond, led an all-day workshop and met with approximately 25 teachers, ESPs, proctors, administrators from the uh, Mitchell Elementary School, as well as district representatives from facilities and food service. The purpose of this meeting was to obtain feedback and insight in regards to the preferred schematic design that was to be submitted to the MSBA for their approval. This valuable exercise was an essential component um, to the building process and it truly assisted us in driving the vision of not only the interior but the exterior learning spaces that will be incorporated within the schematic design. 
I'd like to take this opportunity to thank all those individuals who participated in that working group, and please know that your time and efforts are greatly appreciated. On Wednesday, April 10th, 2019, I, along with the Bridgewater Town Manager, Michael Dutton, attended the MSBA board meeting at their offices in Boston. I'm very happy and proud to report at this meeting, the Mitchell Elementary School project was relighted to proceed forward with the preferred schematic design. On Monday, April 22nd, RDA presented an updated schematic design um, in, that incorporated all of the ideas and concepts that were presented by the 25 individuals who participated in the working group on April 1st to the members of the school building committee. The project budget, floor plan, site, landscape, play area, HVAC, and electrical systems, and lead checklists were all presented and reviewed. The members of the school building committee provided our designers and consultants with feedback to further uh, uh, refine the schematic design. The school building committee um, will meet on a regular basis right up until July 8th. Um, where we hope to receive local uh, approval to submit a final schematic design to the MSBA in hopes of receiving their approval to proceed further in the process at their Wednesday, August 28th, 2019 board meeting. Additional public forums will take place on Wednesday, May 8th at 1 p.m. at the Senior Center and on June, uh, Thursday, June 13th here in the lecture hall at 7 p.m. We encourage uh, all community members to please attend these important informational meetings and as always additional George H. Mitchell Elementary School project and MSBA information updates can now be found at www.bridgewaterschoolproject.com. Thank you. Very good, thank you. And next up we have our transportation and child care update, uh, Mr. Swenson. Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. As you know, um, over the course of the last year since the elimination of pay to ride, um, my team has been working with uh, members of uh, the community to try to help assist um, some of those parents that may have some difficulties with transportation. And also on the Rainham side, we're seeing that as uh, the town of Rainham grows, um, so does the need for before and after school care. And I've been working very closely with the director of uh, the Park and Recreation Program, Mr. Tim McRae, who is uh, here uh, this evening, uh, along with Mr. Bewley, who's here from our base program uh, on the Bridgewater side. First, in, in regards to the transportation piece, I would say that we reached out to, and um, I'd like to thank, I thought I saw her here, she might have, I know she's back there. This is George, um, who's done a wonderful job over the course of the last year reaching out to local vendors, um, um, transportation vendors, to see if this is something that they would want to take on privately with our families as a cottage, a little cottage industry. Um, we did get um, some um, feedback from a few, but really, truly, one company in particular um, really had some interest, and that was uh, ANA Metro here uh, in Bridgewater on Route 18, and owner Tom Riggi. Um, and over the course of the last few months, myself and um, Mrs. George have been meeting with Mr. Riggi. Um, we've been explaining how the district ran the pay to ride program. We talked about routing. We talked about payment schedules. We talked about um, a lot of different components of the pay to ride program. He has agreed now to take that on. Uh, we met with Mr. Um, Riggi last week over um, April vacation. Uh, we kind of did some uh, finalizing of things that he had questions on in regard to the program. Uh, today he did submit to us. Um, so an informational uh, flyer uh, that we will be um, presenting to those families next week. Uh, we again, we've identified those uh, former pay to ride families and the non-eligible riders, and we will be presenting that uh, information to them. Again, that will be a uh, contract that is done privately with um, Mr. Riggi and a, a Metro and the families. It is not affiliated with the Bridgewater Rainham Regional School District. I just want to uh, stress that and emphasize that uh, to our families. Um, and we do thank uh, Mr. Riggi uh, for all his time and efforts in, in, in being able to take this on. And uh, we're hoping that this is uh, a program that will be able to assist 
uh, some of those families who, um, unfortunately, with the elimination of pay to ride, as we know, was not sustainable uh, by the district in, in regard to not being reimbursed um, by the state for that and the fees that we had just could not keep up with um, the amount of product that we had to put on the road to support that program. So that's one piece uh, to, to the puzzle, which we're hoping will help some of our families. Uh, the second one is on the Rainham side. Um, on the Rainham side, uh, currently, uh, the Park and Recreation Program is, is growing exponentially with the amount of uh, families moving in, which we said is great. We, we love having um, you know, school-age families moving in. But again, with a lot of parents working, uh, both working, uh, they do need care before and after school. Uh, currently, there's a wait list at um, the Park and Recreation Program. I do want to stress, too, because I know that sometimes there's a lot of um, misconception and, and misinformation out there that the park and recreation before and after school program is not run through the district. That is run through the park and recreation department in Rainham. On the Bridgewater side, however, the Bridgewater Rainham Regional School District runs a uh, program through Mr. Buley and the base program uh, at the Mitchell Elementary School and at the Williams. So what we've done is um, we've, we've come together, uh, we've had several meetings over the course uh, of the last uh, year. We talked about uh, creating a supplemental program um, at the Rayham Middle School um, to help uh, alleviate that wait list um, for park and recreation and provide a service uh, to our uh, families in Rayham who may be on that wait list. It is going to be run through Mr. Buley, um, and, but it is going to again be a supplemental program. It's not going to be a competitive program with park and rec. Point being is that families will have to go through park and recreation first, apply through them. If they are placed on the wait list, they will then be given an application for uh, the program that will be uh, run at uh, the Rainham uh, Middle School. Um, with that, with the permission of the um, committee, I'd like to invite you, Mr. McCray um, and possibly Mr. Buley. Uh, to the um, podium so they can talk a little bit about where we are in the process and um, again similar to the, the uh, informational flyers that will go up from a and Metro next week we're looking to promote uh, the supplemental program next week to our families uh, in the town of Lane. several times this year and it's been a it's been a really enlightening experience you know we uh, we're coming together to really try to alleviate a problem that we've had in the town of Rainham um, it's going to be an overflow program so basically it's going to be two separate entities coming together to solve a problem we have currently over 100 families right now on our wait list and as we get closer to next school year we expect that list to grow so currently on our end we have applied to the state for daycare expansion. Right now we have morning and afternoon at delivery, and currently we have only morning at the middle school. The goal is, and unfortunately we are waiting on the state, which is the hardest part on our end, is our goal is to increase the number we have in the morning. Right now we have 26 students eligible at Merrill in the morning and nobody in the afternoon. With our goal, we're going to go to 39 in the morning and 52 in the afternoon in Merrill and keep the 52 we have in the morning at Liberty and 78 in the afternoon. That way we'll be able to alleviate quite a bit, knock on wood, on our wait list. And then those that are interested, my office is going to reach out to the families on the wait list and find out who would be interested in the overflow program. Mr. Buley, uh, we come up with the name of RMAC, <laughs> uh, which stands for the Rainham uh, Middle Alternative Care. Uh, and those students on the wait list, once we get that information back on who is interested in joining, we'll pass it along to Mr. Buley, and he will get those going. But once a spot opens up in our program, they will will contact my office with the schools, and they will come back into our program. It's a great way for two municipal departments to come together and really solve a problem. 
I have a quick question. Which yeah. is, I, I just want to reiterate, I think we've said this many times, so even though there's quite a bit of a, a waiting list, we still want to encourage people to sign up. Yes. Okay, so <coughs> you hear throughout the town, oh, there's a big wait list. Well, we're, we know that, and we still want you to sign up, because in the end, in the summer, we're going to disperse those people and hopefully take care of everyone on that list if possible. That's it. That is the ultimate goal. You know, again, as I mentioned, I'm not going to <laughs> As I mentioned, though, we really have to get the state to give us that final go ahead because we have the EEC license over our head, so we cannot go out of ratio. We can't have more than that number of students there, or we can have some serious trouble. So, as soon as they get out, you know, I feel positive about it. It's just a matter of what we're playing the waiting game right now. So, as of now, we are going to continue to go forward with the overflow program. You know, hope that we get approval sooner rather than later, so we can really figure this this out going forward. Thank you. And the prices of the program and the pay skills and um, pay schedules, I should say, are going to mirror that in Park and Rec. Um, again, so if something someone does pay for a week and then they have a little spot comes open to um, Park and Rec, they'll be able to transition uh, the following week. Again, they. Thank this gentleman enough and what Mr. Buley does uh, for our base program. He runs a tremendous program uh, on this side of the district. And I have the utmost confidence that he'll be able to implement um, just as an effective program uh, for the students uh, on the radio side. So, Mr. Buley. Um, 13 years ago, when I started at the base program, there were probably 20 kids. We're now almost pushing 500. Uh, so, I can imagine the same thing was happening in the Base is looking forward to working with Park and Rec and uh, truly the because a lot of parents are moving in and we need to take care of the kids. If that's what we'll do, we'll get it done. Right. So we have we, and I do want to thank um, Mrs. Charette and, and Mrs. Westell uh, who have been part of those meetings, Mr. Powers, uh, Ellen George, um, uh, Kathy, Macedo. We're all collectively working together as a team to figure out um, space availability. Um, and that's going to kind of be a tricky uh, piece to that because that program before school and after school, um, we're going to have to figure that out because if you have had elementary school students there before school, the, um, the middle school day is going to begin. So we've got to be a little bit uh, cognizant of that. Um, also, um, anyone knows the world of middle school, um, after school there's a, a enormous amount of um, activities that happen, uh, whether it be intramurals or um, athletics there or uh, the numerous clubs. Um, so we really got to kind of figure out some of those logistics um, rather quickly. So we want to get that information out in the, in the next uh, few weeks. Our goal is to try to, by, I think we put a date of like May, May 23rd, that we would have an idea of exactly who is going to be on that wait list, who's going to be in our program. And at that point, um, Mr. Buley can then post for his positions um, that he needs and hopefully hire those folks uh, prior to uh, leaving for uh, the summer. And then we'll be able to hit the ground running come September. Good. Thank you, everyone. Well, thank you for all your efforts, Peter. So next up, we have our FY19 quarterly budget report, and I'm not sure if anybody has done wants to go home. Can we dismiss the yeah, they, people that my <laughs> admin team feel needs to leave? We certainly understand. <laughs> Kathy's gonna leave. Yeah. <laughs>
large blanket type encumbrances, which means those amounts may or may not come to fruition. So you may see that throughout the report. Um, I'm, I'm seeing some of them are obviously showing that they're not going to come to what the total encumbrance is, and I'll point that out as I go along. But on page one and two, we start at the bottom on page one and the top of page two. This is our IT area, and again, here we have um, several accounts with large encumbrances that um, end up putting the budget balance into the negative. However, overall, in these line items, um, if you look at the bottom line on page two at the top, we were still in the positive by $5,528. So um, overall, we'll be able to cover any of those that may come to fruition as deficits. Our next section on page three, you'll notice at the bottom, down in the teacher line, uh, we had at the beginning of the year, when we did the budget, um, determined that we would use school choice funds and we were going to use $500,000 worth of school choice funds. We were going to take teacher payments and then charge them to the school choice line account. And that's what that is showing at the high school. Um, you can see an account that has $500,000 in deficit. I'm going to be taking those expenditures and moving them to school choice so that deficit will go away. Okay, so it, it, it's just a good reminder that we'll be doing that at year end. Uh, page four, our substitute lines down toward the bottom. As you know, we talked about um, some new line account numbers that um, the state has asked us to do. They wanted us to break out long-term substitutes, and that was for folks who were 30 days or more in a particular position. And as that occurs, we move money from the short-term subs, which are more the day-to-day -day subs, up to those lines. But you'll see that we have a few accounts that have negative balances. Although overall, um, we are about $11,697 to the good um, from last year's expenditures at this time. And that includes everything from teachers, nurses, ESPs, and secretaries. So we're doing pretty, pretty well as far as um, trying to keep down those um, expenses. And again, overall, in that whole section, we still have about $90,000 um, from now to a year in. So that, that looks pretty good at this point. But again, the summer's coming, and the uh, months down in uh, May and June sometimes is where we see most of those expenditures occurring. Um, the rest of the budget up until page 8 is pretty much um, all in black and doing well. So if we go to page 8, uh, again, one of our areas is special education transportation. And as I look at this, I notice um, encumbrances that are still pretty high considering we're more than halfway through the school year. So that indicates to me that chances are those are not going to come to fruition. They're going to be something less than what's there. So I'm anticipating that the overall 568000 that we're in deficit is going to be something less than that. Um, and we're working with the um, business office staff and the special education department to start culling out some of those um, transportation purchase orders that can now start to be reduced. Um, I, page nine. Uh, page nine is where we have our utilities. We have heating of the building kind of at the top of the page. And then we have electricity, water, and telephone. Um, it looks to me, uh, with the heating of the building, we have still 213,000 encumbered. I think Paul shut the heat off. <laughs> so if the heat's shut off, I think we're going to see that we're not going to be spending the 213. I think that's going to help resolve that uh, balance there of 83,000 that's in the negative. Uh, electricity, we did say we would use some of the um, base funds because we are you know, extending in, in the morning and at night the use of the building and using electricity. Um, and it's a legitimate cost to be able to charge off to base. So it will help us a little bit with those electricity bills. Um, water, we still have 111,000 encumbered. We've only spent 73. Um, I think we're going to be pretty close, though, because I think we're a little bit behind in some of the bills because of some issues that we 
it had with metering. Um, going down to maintenance of building, down at the bottom, page nine at the bottom, you'll see that we have a lot of accounts that appear to be in deficit, but then again, we have a lot of large encumbrances. Um, those are blanket type encumbrances for if an emergency occurs, um, Mr. Fox can then just go right to the store he needs to go to to purchase whatever it is without having to go through the red tape of, I have to do a requisition, I have to wait for it to be um, approved, and so on and so forth. And we'll also be working in May with Mr. Fox to help um, go through those and start identifying which ones can be released. Uh, page 10, uh, we just have to watch our ins health insurance lines. <clears throat> the active health is kind of a little bit heading toward the um, uh, last section of the, the page, a little from the middle down. And um, the reason why I say we have to watch that, we look like we have spent 4.4 million in health insurance and still have about 2.8. We have to remember teachers, um, their pay is gonna go through longer than what we have left for pay periods. So they're gonna have that lump sum payroll that's gonna pick up the July and August months. So um, we have to keep in mind that we're gonna be spending a little bit more than just a few more months insurance there. So we'll keep an eye on that. We do have some grants that will help offset some of this. Um, right now we're charging everything here, but we have folks who are on grant who take health insurance and we'll, you know, reclass those payments to those grants we were born. And last but not least, page 11, uh, we had some changes with our school choice sending numbers that we had uh, that differed from the estimates from the governor's budget. Uh, we always use governance cherry sheet figures um, because that, as you know as we're going through the process now it changes it goes up and down looks like we're gonna get money and then they take it away so um, we always go with that because we feel that's a very conservative number to use um, but unfortunately with the school choice sending and the charter school we have to pay for those and so we have to account for the additional amount uh, being charged to the budget and so I just wanted to point out that we have done that already with this so when we look at the bottom line of the 5.3, there's going to be things that are going to come off um, that aren't particular that aren't encumbered right now because they can't be like health insurance, subs, um, and uh, the line might be in that, but um, Medicare and, and those types of things. So that 5.3 million will be dropping down, um, but we've already accounted for the school choice and the charter. So it um, looks like we'll be you know, coming in pretty close this year, and um, hopefully by May we'll have a better picture of just where we might be in June. Anyone have any questions for Mr. Macedo? Well, I don't have questions on the fiscal year 19 budget, but last night I attended the town council meeting in Bridgewater, and Mr. Wood, the budget chair, mentioned that he will be in contact with you if he hasn't already about looking at the fiscal year 20 budget to see if there's any capital expenditures that we have in there that shouldn't be in there that might help us come closer to our number. I was kind of like, good luck with that, but so just expect a call from the bridge one. Okay, yes, we have sent them information that he's requested, so. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? Thank you very much, thank appreciate you, it. You're All right, next up we have the treasurer's quarterly report, Mr. Connolly. Chair, members of school committee, um, I did send to all of you the um, nine month budget um, and all the figures that relate to it. I wanted you to see the income that we've gained for the nine months and the expenses that we've done. Um, actually, yeah, if you've looked at it, um, most everything seems very uh, even. Following along for the next three months, we should be in very good shape. Um, one of the things I looked at, and I was at actually talking to Ms. Masillo about, was the um, Chapter 71 transportation. We may see a little bit more in that. Um, we budget, Kathy it does a great job and follows like the governor's budget and knows that the House and Senate are going to drive her crazy. So um, we may get 1.8, she budgeted 1.6. And that's a maybe, and, and that's um, 
might have a little bit, $234,000 or more. So, um, but everything else is going along, uh, as I said, in line. Um, I don't know if you have any questions. Um, I will let you know that, um, you know, I still have money in the bank, as you can see in the bottom, and use that to pay the rest of the bills for it. Um, but any questions you want, and, and the balance, it, it, just for, I gave you like total swoop all the way through March, and the bank balance would be about, uh, for the nine months, would be about 12 million, which you're trying to keep that um, figure going throughout, throughout the whole year, so. Any questions? Mr. Dolan? Yeah, I just have a quick question about the governor's budget and the House and Senate budgets. And, um, when will we find out what that Chapter 71 number is? Um, well, <laughs> it's, so it's the FY20s. So. Yeah, so F, well, so we don't actually know it for FY19, do we? Because we got money for FY18. Because it's, it's, frankly, it's a kludgy way they do it, but. Yeah, um, they pay us twice a year for Chapter 71. And what ends up happening um, a lot of times is at the end of the year, they may find in their budget that they're able to do a little bit different percentage, or we might get a little bit more for, um, occasionally I'm trying to think of, I mean, Kenny Vento, um, and, you know, Matt, yeah, um, not special budget. Any I was thinking vocational ed because we used to get that money too. Um, so we may get a little extra um, when they settle up with all the towns and, and whatnot. They go based on your end of year report um, for the prior year. So they're estimating. So when I actually send in the information, then they take off, you know, from that percentage, not from the prior. So that may, may change as well. Once they have looked at the 18 budget and seen what we actually reported, then they'll be able to give us whatever the difference is. But it looks like right now we're going to be getting the 1.8, which I had used the governor's number of 1.6, which again now is based on 17 or 16 figures. So it's you know it's kind of old figures. So, if we do so get, that will go to E&D. So if we do get that 1.8 instead of 1.6, that 200,000, would that extra money be able to be spent? Which you can't spend it. That's revenue that has come in. Exactly. What will happen is that will close out. Now, you may have some accounts that you didn't get enough in, so you have to cover those accounts, uh, revenue accounts. But overall, if everything comes in the way we estimated, mm -hmm. then that would just close to E&D. That would help that 1.7 that we're using a million of climb maybe to <coughs> so we'll pay ourselves back for the money we took from our E and D savings to fund. It'll help us, yeah. Okay. And you always want to budget conservatively because if your revenues are short, you have to cut your budget. Mm -hmm. Right. Thank you. Any other questions? Yeah. All right. There any more questions for Mr. Conley? We're all good. We're all good. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Conley. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right, so we've done our personnel report. We do not have any unfinished business. And now we're going to move on to new business and we did the surplus with Mr. Fox. And in your school committee packet, you will notice that there was a new uh, North River Collaborative Agreement and that is because I believe that Holbrook would like to join the collaborative and because that is such, we need a motion to approve the amended changes to the collaborative agreement as presented and proposed in consultation with the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education. Motion for that amended change by Mrs. Scoparis, second by Mrs. King. Any discussion? And Mr. Swenson, you recommend this? Yes. All right, sure. uh, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? So voted. All right, and we'll move on to our approval. Madam Chair, oh, I'm if sorry. I may for, um, ask through you to Mr. Swenson, would you just give us some highlights for our viewers of the benefits of the district of being a member of the North River Collaborative? So, some things, services that we maybe do not want to, um, that we may not have available to us in terms of um, special ed uh, programming uh, service providers. Um, they can provide us um, 
those type of uh, uh, services without us having to hire our own folks with benefit packages and, and the rest. So it's, it's, a, it's a cost avoidance measure that we're able to, um, you know, especially to in, in a pinch when we may need a school site or we may need speech or, or something along those lines, but they also have um, programming that if some of our students need and not a district placement, the collaboratives are a lot more cost effective than a private school setting. So we try to go the collaborative route, whether it be North River or Reeds first, and then Mr. Joe Velos, if, if, if they can't get, uh, but they don't feel like that's appropriate, we'll then um, look to um, other private type uh, institutions for, for our students who need out of the district, so. Okay, thank you. Thank you. And now we're going to move on to the approval of warrants. And first we'll have the payroll warrants dated March 28th, 2019 and April 11th, 2019. Motion by Mrs. Skilparis, second by Mrs. King. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? So voted. Thanks. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, um, never mind. Um, I'm sorry. I thought we were short. Okay. No five. <laughs> now we'll have the general ledger warrants dated March 28, 2019, and April 11, 2019. Motion by Mrs. Skilpara, second by Mr. Dolan. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? So voted. And now we do have. Uh, Madam Chair, if I could. Yes, sir. Um, it, I, under new business, I'd like to make a motion that the school committee vote that the last day of school uh, be on Monday, June 17th, 2019, and that would be a half a day of school. Motion by Mr. Dolan, last day of school, Monday, June 17th, uh, half day. Motion, or did you have a question? No. Nope. Oh, I'm sorry. Motion <laughs> by <laughs> Mrs. King, second no. by I Mrs. Holbrook. Oh, all right. <laughs> <laughs> motion by Mike, second, second by Mrs. Whatever. Holbrook. All those in favor? Uh, Aye. Any opposed? No, great, thank you. So voted. All right, moving on to uh, acceptance of gifts. Mr. Swenson. Yes, Madam Chair, we have one um, gift uh, this, this month. And not to give away too much, because we are going to recognize uh, these students uh, next month, but two of our DECA students um, did qualify for the nationals um, for the DECA competition that will take place in Orlando. Um, obviously, it's very expensive in terms of travel and whatnot, and they will be accompanied by the um, advisor, Mr. Ferrara, and we will recognize those students in May. However, um, to um, offset the costs, they did write a grant through BSU. The BSU, as generously as they always do, granted um, a $3,000 grant for those students. So we're so appreciative of uh, BSU and the partnership grants um, and all that they do to support us and our students. So thank you to Sue McComb and all the folks that serve on that uh, partnership uh, community grant. Um, for allowing us uh, that opportunity for our students. Very good. Motion to approve uh, the acceptance of gifts. Motion so by Mr. Dolan, second by <clears throat> Mrs. Skilparis. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? So voted. And next we're up to public comment. Anyone like to have a comment for the public? Seeing none, very good. And before we adjourn, um, I would also like to recognize, this is a night of thank yous, uh, today is Administrative Assistant Day, and we would like to thank Judy McDougall for all her hard work and wisdom in keeping the school committee organized and compliant. Uh, managing eight schedules for meetings and events is a challenge. Uh, answering the superintendent's phone is a super challenge. Um, your calmness and ability to multitask are greatly appreciated, and we thank you very much for your dedication and support for the Bridgewater Rangham communities. Would you like to speak? Go ahead. I just have a few announcements. Go ahead. Go ahead. Oh, all right. Um, and this Saturday, the town elections are going to be held. And due to the late election date, the school committee is going to hold a special meeting for the purpose of reorganizing on April 30th at 6.30 in the superintendent's conference room. And our next regu regular school committee meeting will be held on May 22nd in the library at the middle school. And Mr. Swenson, did you have? Just middle school. Middle school. Right here, middle school. 
Thank you. Thank you, Manager. And then uh, Mr. Fox um, took us up on our offer to jet, but I just wanted to thank Mr. Fox. Um, he, he is leaving us after uh, two years of service. Um, he, he's brought a lot to the district. Um, he definitely brought a different um, perspective and, and lens to that uh, facilities job. Uh, he brought a lot of um, uh, grant money in through us. He also likes to spend a lot of money. Uh, he's, uh, uh, he's like the little brother I never wanted, but um, I, I, uh, I do thank him for all of his uh, service, and I wish him well in his um, new position. And also, he is going to um, be getting married, too, uh, this, this year, so um, he better make some money. <laughs> well, we wish him well. And with that, did anyone else have any announcements? I just want to say thank you again for the kind words, and it was a pleasure to serve the district. And thank you, Pat, for you know for putting up with me. <laughs> I drove you up. But... <laughs> All right. So with that, a motion to adjourn at 8:51. Motion by Mrs. Scoparis. Yes. Second by Mrs. Holbrook. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Very good. So